This podcast is brought to you through support from our partner, the Kaliapea Foundation. Kaliapea envisions a future grounded in compassion, respect, dignity, reverence for nature, and care for each other and the earth. Other organizations they support include the Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance and Led to Life. To learn more about Kaliapea's mission, visit Kaliapea.org. Welcome to For the Wild Podcast. I'm Ayana Young. I think it's really unfair that we always, almost always blame poor folks for everything. Poor people can, you homeless and you having a kid, people are looking like at you like you're crazy when reproductive justice or reproductive health is everyone's God-given right. It's everyone's. It has nothing to do whether you have no money, no house, no nothing, no education, no nothing. It is a biological function of the earth. It is a natural way that things have always been done. And so what's unnatural is wealth hoarding and resource hoarding. That's what's unnatural. Today we are speaking with the Roots of Labor Birth Collective. In their own words, Roots of Labor Birth Collective or RLBC, is committed to providing support and care for birthing members of our community. RLBC consists of birth doulas of color. We strive to reflect the communities we serve while uplifting and caring for ourselves under these guiding principles. Decolonizing birth, honoring birth, empowering ourselves and each other, and sustaining doula work. On behalf of Roots of Labor Birth Collective, we are joined by Juju Angelis and Elena Aurora. Juju Angelis is an active doula of RLBC, currently occupying Ohlone Territory, West Oakland, California, and serving the Bay Area. Juju is a mother, homeschools, works with plants, and supports people through their pregnancy, labor, birth, and postpartum journey. Juju is the founder of Baby Mamahood, an online platform to dismantle, reimagine, and reclaim solo parenting for women and people of color in the hood. Elena Aurora is the co-founder and education director of Roots of Labor Birth Collective. It is her honor to organize with the radical and inspirational doulas of the Bay Area, California. She is mixed race, Peruvian, and European descent, and has an environmental project called Woke and Wasteless that queers the conversation between the disposability of stuff and the disposability of people of color. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Elena and Juju, and I'd really like to begin this interview by centering the topic of reproductive justice as it relates to healing communities. For our listeners, I'll mention that the term reproductive justice was coined by a caucus of black feminists at a 1994 pro-choice conference in Chicago, and it is intended to extend beyond discourse that solely focuses on the right to have or not have children, but also the right to raise that child in a safe and healthy environment. It forces us to differentiate between legality and accessibility. So I'd love to open up to both of you and ask, what does reproductive justice mean to you in a culture inundated with economic, environmental, and racial disparity? Ooh, yes. I'm going to take the uh, rest of the interview. (laughs) Yeah, right? (laughs) Awesome. Yeah, thank you for having us. We're really excited to be here. Yes, thank you. Um, did you want to start? What what does reproductive justice mean for us? Basically, mm-hmm. it really you know for me as a as a poverty scholar, someone who who um, really comes from also a class perspective on this, um, I just feel like there's never going to be no justice until the land is free. So when the land is free, that's when we're going to see a lot of these these paradigms that we have of violence and destruction, whether in a, on a community level as someone who lives in the hood or like on a more global, even like American U.S. level with all this war and extraction on bodies and minds and earth is like so prevalent. And so freedom, justice for me is, is really rooted in, in all of those things. We really cannot talk about freedom without really thinking about what is free and nothing is free. Um, people own the land. Why does why do people need more than one house? Why do we need to mm-hmm. you know to why do we need to ship things? Why is you know globalization is like also killing our planet? So, but how does this all tap into reproductive justice? I mean, 
it taps into capitalism too, because capitalism is where, you know, race came into play. Like the reason why there was slavery and why native people were also enslaved and their land was taken away was because of this idea of capitalism and, you know, like the survival of all this fucked up, excuse me, all this, I should have asked when we curse on this podcast, (laughs) um, all this messed up, you know, notions around who gets to have land and who gets to exploit the land and who benefits from the land. And the same thing is happening to people's bodies who are pregnant and giving birth is that this is big business. And so Mm. because it's big business, we're doing all the things to show, um, to tell people who are pregnant, um, that they don't have the capacity or the power to, to give birth on their own terms, that they need to be numb, that they need to have all these, you know, medicines, because why be a martyr? Why, you know, why do this on your own? Like, why, why, right? And so we know that these realities impact women and people of color the most, because we have the ones that have always been silenced. We have the ones who's always done all the labor without any recognition, the emotional labor, the home labor, the labor of dealing with families who are being broken up by this. So all this stress has compounded to the way to to the point where I forget the scholar, the women scholar, the black woman scholar who talks about weathering on the bodies of black people in particular, but I'm sure it could also extend to indigenous people of this land because they have also faced um, insurmountable just pain and and struggle and and a lot of silence, but even more so than black um, people, um, because for me it's easy to find scholarship on on African American people and black people globally, but it's harder for indigenous people of mm. this land, I feel like. And even of the lands that I represent as a Taino descendant of the Dominican Republic, Quisqueya. So I mean it's it's all it's all intricately tied and woven and the impact on our DNA and our and in our people has really, really like informed the way that we give birth. And it's and stress is a killer, and it's killing our people um, even in the hospital room, which is the majority. I mean, that's where overwhelmingly where black people, even white folks, are giving birth at. And so it's 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 really deep. This work is extremely hard. I was just telling Atlanta, like, people be like, oh, you're a doula, and they think it's glamorous. It's not glamorous work. Like, I'm not doing this work because it's beautiful and euphoric, and I get all these wonderful feelings when people give birth. Um, that's, not the cr- that's not the crux of it. That's a very small moment on this journey of parenting and also underst- hearing, the, hearing the fear and the struggle that people of color are birthing their children in is like... I'm trying to give my folks hope just through baby mama hood alone, but like it's it's it it is beautiful, but it's also very, 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 very hard. And black mothers, indigenous mothers are afraid to give, or I should say parents, just to be non binary, but we are afraid to give birth into this society because we know and we actually feel what it what it's like to be a person of color in this world. And so there's so many facets and so many ways that this work is connected to everything because everyone has to be born Mm. yeah thank you juju that's that that hits it on the head (laughs) (laughs) i i think i'll add that like you know you talked about the fear and struggle and i just as working with our clients as people for people of color black folks indigenous folks migrant folks native folks um latino folks the fear and struggle that that people that the conditions that people are in that reduce maternal heart rates that mm. or re- maternal health rates that reduce um, fetal birth weights and things like that those are actually symptoms of climate change which is a symptom of colonization which is a symptom of capitalism so it's like you know it, it's all very interrelated we're here on the front lines working with our clients making sure that they get what they need facing racism in the hospitals you know whatever the case is. And we know that these are all side effects of a larger systemic issue of a sick society. Well, thank you both so much for that introduction that really set the stage. And I want to go a bit more into these reproductive rights issue. And historically, the state has always intervened on issues of reproductive rights when it comes to women of color, sanctioning this medical control through the guise of 
concern for health and well-being when the true motivation is always forced assimilation and population control. Examples of this vary from the one in four Native women who were sterilized without consent or knowledge in the 60s and 70s, Mexican, Latinx, and Black women who were targeted during the era of eugenics, and then the 1977 Hyde Amendment Act, which withdrew all federal funding for abortions, but still allowed the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare to federally fund surgical sterilizations. Inevitably, forcing low-income women to choose permanent infertility if they wanted to exercise their reproductive rights. Or in Canada, how prior to the decriminalization of contraceptives in 1969, the government distributed birth control to First Nations women in an effort to curb birth rates. And then in relationship to midwifery, the mid-1900s witnessed a wave of government interventions across the country to control and regulate midwives with the goal of long-term elimination. In the South and Southwest, governments specifically went after African American, Indigenous, and Hispanic midwives, forcing them to get permission slips from licensed doctors, undergoing cleanliness and uh, medical bag inspections, and forbidding them from carrying herbal remedies. I know there is a lot there, but I really would love if you could share with us how many are still presently forced to make reproductive choices that are directly influenced by colonialism and white supremacy? Yeah, you know, all of the examples that you that you just laid out, I appreciate you putting that out there because those are our ancestors. Those mm. are the people who direct our work today, like whether they're elders in the community who remember right. those things, yeah. who have lived through them, um, or our grandparents who are no longer with us who remember mm -hmm. those things and lived through that. So I just want to take a moment to honor them and honor their journeys in reproductive justice and the, that, that they have brought us, both myself and Juju, but mm -hmm. us as a greater collective, us as a greater consciousness of society um, to this place. You know, I don't think it's a coincidence that reproductive justice is in this sort of wave of resurgence. Um, and a lot of what you said, I, I want to dial back to specifically the pieces around abortions, um, <clears throat> especially granny midwives in the South, both black women and indigenous women, as you mentioned, were banned from carrying their herbs or banned from carrying their medicines. And I want to point it out that the reasons why that that happened is because of the misogyny and patriarchy that exists within the medical system that before Western medicine came from Europe and came to these lands, people were taking care of their own. And um, I just want to point out that especially for black people who were slaved, they were, they didn't have access to medicine in the sense that the white folks wouldn't get, let them have access to medicine. So they carried their own, which is from their homelands, which is from learning the herbs, learning the land, building relationship. Um, and that the reason why uh, they were able to be so targeted around cleanliness was actually because of abortions. Because back then, mm. a midwife would take care of any reproductive need that you had, whether you were going through menopause, whether you were having hot flashes, whether you were having a baby, whether um, you had been raped and needed to get have an abortion mm. or not raped and you just didn't want to have a kid. Taking care of the body and having like ownership and control of 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 your own reproductive cycle was handled by midwives because abortions were seen as unorthodox. They were seen as, um, what is that when it's not morally correct, they, it unethical. Was unethical, that they were able to use that rhetoric to then mm. turn the masses against granny midwives and black midwives. Um, so I just want to, I think in this time when people are really worried about abortion access, we really have to remember that the rhetoric for abortion was actually a tool to discredit midwifery, specifically black and brown midwives. Mm. And also the, the piece around these reproductive, bo like reproductive bodies, whether however they identify, if you control a reproductive body, you control the people. Mm. If you control how a person gives birth, you control the people. Um, and for folks whose bodies were literally so bought and sold, that is a tremendous amount of wealth and power that you can hold and manifest, which is why people who have um, womb spaces or who can create from their womb, whether that's through manifestation or through um, like physically birthing a baby, mm. they're to our society, our patriarchal and misogynistic society. Um, and so I forgot what your original question was, but um, 
I just want to highlight that you control the masses by controlling people, food, and land. And you do that by controlling reproductive bodies. I also want to just say one thing about the granny midwife um, that I just found out recently and I wanted to share this is that there was a conference that happened in the 80s um, with black midwives and most of them were or call all the um, granny midwives. And they said that they don't like that name, granny midwife. It's something that they really did not like. It was given to them in the time of slavery. Mm -hmm. And so in that conference, they decided that they, someone in the conference said, well, let's call you grand midwives. Mm -hmm. And they really appreciate that. So again, like how language controls the the narrative because they were just midwives. You know, they weren't granny midwives. The granny midwives identify them as black, Mm. also enslaved folks. And they they were doing the work that these providers didn't want to do because a lot of these doctors, they're really there to, to, to deal with high risk or like, you know, potentially really bad things. And I also wonder like, where does these, these GYN folks, where did they learn about birth? Mm-hmm. They learned through the midwives and they, they had a, I feel like a secret collaboration where the granny midwife of the South, the, sorry, the grand midwives of the South and these doctors are working together and it was like, it seemed like a good marriage between, you know, medicalized care and traditional care. But then after a while, they just started to phase them out. And I mm-hmm. think they phased them out because they got everything that they needed to get. Mm-hmm. They learned all the things they needed to learn. Mm-hmm. Right. And so, you know, I also forgot what the question was, but I do think that like, I do think that is really important that, that, you know, I appreciate that you took time aside to really ground us in knowing that these, this is our history and it's a very painful one. And it it's, it's for me, there's such a link now with the, the infant maternal mortality rate and the phasing out of these providers. Mm. Like there's a direct link between that. Um, and when we talk about serialization and forced sterilization and population control and yada, 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 you know, that's also very true. You know, I had this, I told you the story before, I had this white radical anarchist that I squatted in a house with in West Oakland years ago when I was trying to find housing. And I have a daughter who's 11. Her name is Zion. And, you know, and at the time, I, everyone knows me, knows that I want to have more kids. And I, and I generally want to do it as a solo parent. And, and he was like, why would you have more kids? The world's fucked up. And I was just like, whoa, buddy, I'm going to have to slow you down. First of all, you're a white man. You cannot tell me or ask me a question why I want to have kids. Why can't, I live in a society where I can have kids freely. Why not? Mm-hmm. You know, that wasn't afforded to us. We were either hands on a field or, or you know, or, or somehow we have to, like, negotiate with people around when, I, when can I have kids or when can I not have kids. And, you know, I think that, like, my right as a person who can give birth is that I should be allowed to birth freely. Um, and it should not be based on any, you know, outside notion. If I don't want to have kids, then I, I've also had abortions. I should also have that right, too. Mm-hmm. So I think that, like, it's interesting, this idea of population control and also with climate change, right? Because we're thinking, like, no more kids because, we, you know, the, it's the, the earth is finite and we can't have any. But who is that message for is mm-hmm. is I've never seen anyone talk to any other person besides black or brown folks around who should not have kids. Mm-hmm. You shouldn't have a kid because you're poor. Well, I think I should have a kid because I am poor because I take up less resources. Mm-hmm. I reuse every damn thing. You know, I like you know my people were already environmentally friendly before this whole green wave or whatever came up to be. We live that way. We live frugally because that that's what our life that's what our life was. And, 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 you know, and this idea of poverty, like it never really bothered me, you know, like I'm not, my aspiration is not to get rich so that I can buy more shit. Like my aspiration is to just be free Mm. and free of everything else along the way. And so I think that like, um, I, I believe that forced sterilization and population control was just a racist, way to try to basically exterminate black and brown folks because that's what that's what they've been trying to do ever since slavery end is to start killing us off because no no longer could society or white men benefit or white families benefit from the labor of black folks in particular Mm -hmm. and of course we want to silence native american people and have less of those people so that they can never have rights to their land because the land is not you know, the land is not, this is not their land. 
Uh, in a deeper spiritual sense, it's our land. But in a political sense, this ain't your land. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not. And 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 it's you know, it's all intricately bound up and so tight that you know, trying to unravel the pieces, everything else is going to kind of spin out. I feel like too. Mm -hmm. There's so much. There's so much that we're holding because of this. And and I and for me, I understand that for sterilization for me is it was about exterminating us but i also think it was about practicing on us to benefit white folks mm The For The Wild podcast team is so grateful for the continued support through our Patreon subscribers. If you haven't signed up yet, head over to www.patreon.com slash for the wild to engage directly with our team, weekly guests, to hear additional content, and receive access to other bonus material throughout the year. Thank you both so much for going so deep and there was so much that you both brought up but I wanted to stay on a very charged topic for a minute longer this idea of overpopulation and who should be having kids in the Anthropocene in climate destabilization in a time when resources like water and soil are depleting rapidly and I've heard so many different opinions on this you know there's the opinion of the earth has reached its carrying capacity and we just simply shouldn't be nobody should be having more children for the most part what doesn't matter what color you are like the earth cannot sustain 9 billion people 10 billion 11 billion people people start to show these graphs of i don't remember but a hundred years ago it was a couple million and now it's billions like just the rate of human growth has gone so quickly and more humans equal less of everything else, more humans, less orcas, more humans, less beavers, more humans, less land for any other creature, whether it's a mammal or bug or tree or whatever. So there's that train of thought. Then there's this also thought that I really get riled up about that people are like, oh, well, we should be the ones having children because we're the educated ones or we have the resources to provide for the children, which I'm sure, you know, you kind of had mentioned it, Juju, in your last statement. Um, a little bit. And then there's another train of thought that, you know, people, for instance, indigenous people to have like how important it is for them to have children to continue passing down the lineage, the knowledge, the traditional ecological knowledge, the knowledge of the land, um, reestablishing language, connection, uh, indigenous sovereignty, indigenous empowerment, so on and so forth. And I, I mean, I could keep going on and on and on. And I know this is such a charged topic for so many people. I, I've seen it um, unravel in many group settings. And I would love to just kind of give you both an open space to share your thoughts regarding whether, you know, things that I had just mentioned or just your own take on it completely. Yeah, uh, I like, it's an interesting question. I like how you framed it. Um, I'm going to be wearing multiple hats as I answer it, both my Woken Wasteless hat and my Roots of Labor hat, um, and me as a mixed race person, um, both part white and person of color. And I guess I want to start off by saying that this idea of, you know, overpopulation or what is the threshold that the planet can hold um, is so controversial because these sci like scientists and different studies um, from what I've seen are mostly run by white folks, um, specifically white men. And so their numbers and data are kind of all over the map and aren't really, um, aren't really re representative of what's happening globally. Um, although they try to in an unbiased way. And so they, you know, 
what is the carrying capacity of the planet? I'll just name that we don't really know. And there's so much controversy around it, um, which I think you alluded to. And also that how could somebody say the planet is overpopulated? We, meaning all of the people on the planet, need to stop having children when we everyone who lives on this planet knows that people have been dis disproportionately affected by genocide, disproportionately affected by climate related things, factory farming, um, living by industrial waste sites. Like they, this is, that is a form of population control because it is reducing people of color's ability to give birth because their bodies are being exposed to toxins. So all of those things are already in effect. And then you have populations of people who are able to be fertile and continue to um, continue to give birth. And I think that it's a tricky question because you did name something like we as educated people should be able to reproduce. I'm not saying that that was your opinion, but that, you, you know, you quoted that. And who are the educated people, right? They're usually white, middle class or upper class folks. We are seeing a surge of like black, brown, and indigenous folks in college and schools. And I really want to honor them in their journey um, mm -hmm. of doing that because it's hard work and it's extremely oppressive. Mm -hmm. um, so what does it mean for people who have achieved economic and education, educational privilege to then be the ones to give birth um, when the reality is that um, babies are going to happen. People keep having sex. Right. <laughs> um, condoms break, you know, birth control doesn't work. Um, stuff happens. And also, you know, as, as a mixed race person, for me personally, I don't want to give birth um, because I don't think that my, the privilege that my father's family has ridden on in the United States for the last couple hundred years, um, they've been able to have their kids and they've been able to like have their kids in comfort and in all of those things. Um, and I don't think I need to carry on that legacy. Will I ever raise children? I don't know. I don't know if that's something that I want. Um, but I don't need to birth them because, uh, I know that that generation, those generations of my family have had that privilege and that's not something that I mm -hmm. need to do. Um, however, my partner is mixed race and indigenous, and I do believe that we need to carry on more indigenous folks mm -hmm. with their ancestral DNAs and their understandings of what has happened in their lifetimes, um, and continue those legacies. Um, so those are the hats that I wear. I will, mm. I will say that there's this documentary, I believe it's on Netflix called a plastic ocean. I mm. think that's the right one where they talk about some, some islands, um, in maybe Samoa. I'm not, I can't quite remember now. Um, but they're talking about how there's so much trash that's washing up on their shores. It's affecting their fertility rates. There's no oh. scientists telling them that, Oh, this is what's happening. But they're mm. like, hello, we're swimming in trash. We're like live, live, literally living in trash. And all of our people cannot get pregnant. When someone gets pregnant, it's a big deal. Um, and so the, the communities that are most affected by climate change and the climate devastation are often the communities that are closest to industrial wastes and all of those things, which are always placed in communities of color. Mm. Um, I used to say, oh, communities of color and or people in poverty, because I wanted to include that, like, sometimes white communities are, are right. in that areas, too. I recently found out that that's actually not true. <laughs> um, that it, 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 whether or not, I mean, there are, I'm sure, some, but that um, statistically speaking, they are way more disproportionately placed, um, toxic waste sites are way more disproportionately placed in black and brown communities. So, um, yeah, that's all, that's all I'll say for now around, around carrying capacity. Yeah. There was something came up, but I kind of forgot it. I think it was okay. along the lines around who gets to decide who has kids, but also just let's be real. Like, why do we always blame the people? Mm. Like, why do the people have to stop having kids? Mm. Right. Like, and when I say the people, I mean, like, people on the ground, people who are not in positions of power. Like, why is it the onus on us? Why, when I go into a store, why is the option that I buy something in plastic? Why isn't the mm. people who are so-called educated and have all the land and all the know-how and can have all the kids, why we're not po forcing them to do something about it? Why mm. have we go have gone to them and say, no, we need to stop doing this. We need to find an alternative way to to do this or to factory or whatever, or to agriculture because it's actually clean on the planet. But why is it that me and you have to think about whether or not we should have kids or not? Because it's, 
if I'm if y'all like the mamas and the daddies of the world and y'all control everything, right? And we are so called just analogy your children. Why is the why are the children the one to blame? Mm -hmm. In a household and the child is emotionally messed up or physically messed up, we'll never blame the kid. We'll blame the people who are their parents, right? The people who are the ones that have control over somewhat of their livelihood and and the culture, whatever. You know, so it's always to blame us. Mm -hmm. Always. We always is the one to blame. It's never them. It's not the people who actually have the power and the capacity to actually change their mind and actually make a lasting impact. Mm -hmm. And so you're right. Who decides what is the caring capacity of the earth? I hear Mama Earth tell me that that you know that was it, you know, mm -hmm. and you know it's. I think it's really unfair that we we always almost always blame poor folks for everything. Poor people can you homeless and you having a kid. People are looking like at you like you're crazy when reproductive justice or reproductive health is everyone's God-given right. It's everyone's. It's, it has nothing to do whether you have no money, no house, no nothing, no education, no nothing. It is a biological function of the earth. It is a natural way that things have always been done. And so what's unnatural is wealth hoarding and resource hoarding. Mm -hmm. That's what's unnatural. What's unnatural are these toxic waste dumps. What's mm -hmm. unnatural are these factories that are being built in communities that's messing up our asthma, all these trucks, mm -hmm. all this production that's what's unnatural mm. it's not whether or not people are should have kids because that's going to happen and so we constantly i feel like me as a person who likes to work with plants and herbs and who is in this work i'm always trying to convince people to to consider to go back to natural because we are slowly and with also with technology we're slowly becoming so disconnected from the earth and one another that the nat what we see as natural is hard. It's too hard. Mm -hmm. You plant your own stuff. You make your own medicine. It's too hard. You know, I could just pop a pill. Mm -hmm. You know, I could just, you know, get a C-session. I could just, you know, whatever. And I'm not trying to say that those things are bad and we shouldn't have them. That's not what I'm trying to say. What I'm trying to say is that the way that we, the way that we always blame poor folks in, in general for every ailment in society, single, I, all these studies against single parents, mm. your child is 80% more likely to go to jail if there's only a mom in the household. I'm like, really? That's what we're going to blame? We're not going to, we're not really going to look at the structural things that are happening, that are in play, that, you know, the rent, how the rent is so ast astronomous that people have to have like three to four jobs to just even have a home over their head. You know, I live with housemates because I have to. Mm -hmm. I love who I live with, but I also have to live in community because if I don't live in community, I'm not going to be a good person. And I'm then, hence, I'm not going to be a good parent. And so, you know, it's always, it's always these scientists, these people who have the power and the knowledge and the, and, and the knowledge or whatever, the wherewithal, they always blame blaming the people on the ground when is they are the ones creating these systems and these societies in, in such a way where we have to conform and exist in a certain way. Mm -hmm. So is having less babies going to change anything? No, we have to change the adults, right? The mama and the daddies of the world, not, you know, we have to change them to change their minds so they can change their behaviors so that we can actually live in this abundant overflow that the earth has been given us for billions of years. Mm -hmm. Yes. Why is this problem now and not then? Were people having less kids then? Mm. No, they weren't. My mom comes from a, a household of six kids. Mm. My my father's side of her, she had 10 kids. Mm. I don't have 10 kids. My <laughs> cousins don't have 10 kids. They have mm. one, two. We're not having more babies. We're having, actually, we're having less kids. Mm. The folks who are having more babies are the non-melanated folks. They're the ones mm -hmm. who are having the more babies now, if we look at the trends now. So, you know, for me, it's just, it's all very interesting, to mm -hmm. just say the least. Yeah, Juju, I <laughs> like what you said around, well, everything, but also, <laughs> like, uh, this idea that you're talking about, like, in the grocery store giving us options, plastic-free yeah. options. I'm thinking about, like, consumerism and how, like, especially, you know, I hear this term a lot with greenwashing around how, you know, even if you go to Target or something, which Target is one of the m three of the most harmful, it's Target, Amazon, and Walmart, the most harmful like right. environmental destructors in California um, because of their warehousing and because of the logistics industry and what they're causing, they're causing asthma rates, birth defects, and things like that because of their diesel trucks in the Inland Valley in Southern California. And so, but you walk into Target and they have so many advertisements, especially to new parents. You know, how many of my clients have gone into Target mm -hmm. to get their registries, um, you know, their birth, their baby shower registries mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, 
and, you know, you want to get green diapers and, you know, all of these things, and you know, the word is called greenwashing, but the idea that we can buy our way into being a, a, a good green parent or, you know, like an environmental parent, especially we live in the Bay Area, it's everywhere. Um, and we have to be careful with that and because marketing is tricky and it makes my clients feel good to know that they can get environmental things. And I'm sitting here being like, oh, my God, it's not really environmental. It's just marketing, you know. Mm. But, um, you know, and of course, we I have those conversations carefully with my clients. Um, but on a, on a bigger scale, of course, a parent is going to want to try to get the more environmental friendly thing, but marketing and capitalism is so clever that it jumbles us up. Mm -hmm. It does it to me all the time. You know, I live my life zero waste and you know, you can look at welcome wasteless if you want to see what that looks like, but also it's hard because their systems aren't set up like that. And so what I love about roots of labor birth collective is we constantly have these conversations and, um, we as a collective, like we do different, like we do uh, baby showers of upcycled good, um, goods because you know babies grow out of their onesies in like two days mm-hmm. and you know and but somebody else needs them or their car seats or whatever and so we try to have like an upcycle economy within roots of labor and clients can come and get their stuff for free and it's really just use things that are still in good condition that can be you know used by someone else um, and all kinds of things but that's a, a way that roots of labor um, and the community here has really tried to to move away from like the consumption patterns because it's really I mean it's literally killing our people Oh my goodness, you both brought up so much, so much important (laughs) perspectives. And I'm like, oh, oh, I want to talk more about that. I want to talk more about that. I want to talk more about that. But I'll just start with wanting to talk more about the toxicity, especially for people of color, because like both of you were talking about how whether it's the landfills, the toxic runoff, the power plants, the um, refineries, you know, where are they located? Uh, they're located in communities of color, and that's by design. And I want to read a quote by Katsy Cook, who is a Mohawk midwife, environmentalist, Native American rights activist, and women's health advocate. And she has said, quote, women are the first environment. In pregnancy, our body sustain life. At the breast of women, the generations are nourished. In this way, we as women are earth, end quote. But, of course, learning about the high levels of contaminants we harbor in our bodies, women harbor their bodies specifically, but honestly all people, um, but women, those contaminants can only be flushed out through pregnancy as they cross through the placenta or through lactation. Cook added that the women can unfortunately be landfills too. Um, I was also speaking with somebody who had mentioned something like um, some like 90% of a woman's toxic load comes out with her first child through breast milk. So uh, this is such a emotional topic, but I'm interested to hear from both of you how you see climate change or more specifically pollution toxicity and even nuclear fallout as a threat to fertility and the ability to bear healthy children and then furthermore how can we live inside of our bodies and care for them knowing they are contaminated and we risk spreading this contamination to our children (laughs) (laughs) yeah I mean, you know, with with the breastfeeding thing that you just mentioned, I always steer clear of that with my clients, <laughs> specifically because depending on, on what demographic and what race my client is, the benefits of breastfeeding will outweigh the toxicity mm-hmm. that the baby is getting because the baby is going to li- like we live in toxicity. When the fires happened uh, here in the Bay Area or, or in Northern California and the Bay Area was unbreathable and unlivable you know, kids couldn't go outside. We couldn't go inside. People were having like stress, really like mental and physiological stress, physical stress of not working out, being outdoors at all. And the reality is like, you know, lots of people got air purifiers and those things, which is great. Um, But the reality is it's toxic all the time. It Mm. just was really Mm. heightened during the fires. So we live in a toxic environment, like apocalypse is here. Like we've been living in it. So how do we manage it? And for me, it's around educating folks that like you should get an air purifier because yes, they're expensive. Yes, they're an investment, but it could increase the, like your lung capacity mm-hmm. and your asthma rates and things like that. So the benefits of breastfeeding definitely outweigh. But mm-hmm. if I'm talking to like a black client, I know that potentially this client has had a ton of 
stigma around breastfeeding going back to slavery. If I'm talking to native clients, um, the same. If I'm talking to Latina clients, you know, especially young folks, I'm, I'm really trying to think about how do they feel? Does it feel uncomfortable? It does it feel too sexual. Like there's mm -hmm. so many other emotions and feelings that we, most of the time with my clients, I never get to the pollution aspects or I mm -hmm. never get to those. Um, unless they're a client who's already like, we're very like-minded and we can, they already know that that's the work that I do. But for the most part, we really like have to balance it. Um, and I guess the reality is like, we've people of color we've been living this way for generations right these toxic mm -hmm. sites have been around us for a long time um i think about in you know a friend just reminded me of the story that in japan when the nuclear waste was happening it was the elder folks who knew that their lifespan their lifespan was coming to an end who volunteered themselves to go clean up that nuclear toxic waste. And to me, I'm like, that is reproductive justice. Those are people, elders who have lived out their lives, who know they're going to die, who are going to like clean up this toxicity. And when we see, I was at the grocery store the other day, some hippie Berkeley bowl, which is like for the most part, pretty hippie, white, mostly um, shoppers, grocery store in the Bay Area. And there was this Asian woman who had a baby and I could tell they were pretty early. Like, you know, she was only a few weeks out, maybe six or seven weeks out. And, um, she was doing okay, you know, but like, of course I'm a doula. I was like, Hey, what's up? You know, we were, we were chatting. Um, and she needed help, like moving, moving something from her basket to the conveyor belt and no one around me was going to help her. And I turned around and I looked, I was like, do you want me to move that? She goes, yeah, please. Thank you. I didn't know what to do, you know? And it's remembering moments like that where like people who are parents need support right? Like we need to step in and fulfill their roles, whether it's a sacrifice or not. I mean, that's mm -hmm. obviously not a sacrifice, me moving something from a cart to a, to a mm -hmm. table. But we really need to think of our pregnant people as part of our society and valuable in our society. She's tired. You could tell she was mm -hmm. tired. I don't know why she was at the grocery store, but she was tired. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, so when I think about like the reality that we live in pollution, that we live in these environments and we have for generations, how do we as a society come together to support our clients, right? Roots of Labor does it in a very particular way around serving our clients and making sure that we have support. Um, but on a larger environmental issue, it's it, it can get really overwhelming. And I, I really do believe that if we stick together, if we continue to be innovative and creative, um, we'll hopefully find solutions. And to that end, you know, around the solution, really listening to Native folks. There are some brilliant ideas that folks are creating to combat climate change and to, like, bring back salmon. The salmon run is happening with Segorte mm -hmm. Land Trust. Um, you know, there's, there's, of course, Standing Rock and things that are going on in NOLA. Like, all of these things are being led by Indigenous communities, and they aren't separate from reproductive justice. They are what I would love to see is more and more white folks understanding and listening mm -hmm. to indigenous people, to black people, to Latino people, to migrant folks around then, what their experiences and are. And then also believe in us. Yes. Because there's such this, there's such this like an academia, right? There's such, there's such, <laughs> in this so-called academia, there's such this people who are educated, went to college and whatever, got a PhD or a master's. They don't want to believe you unless you have scientific data mm. to prove it. And it's like, Science, scientific data ain't helping. Like, look at the world. It's un, it's, you know, we're under a fire, whether it's metaphorically speaking or for real. And it's just like, it's just like, believe us and then do the things that we're asking you to do because mm -hmm. that is consent. And what, what often happens is that these anthropologists, right, mm -hmm. they come into our communities, they dig up all this shit, they find this stuff, and then they create a study around it, and they say, these people are Don tried, and they don't know what to do, they don't have, we have our own scholarship, that's why I started the podcast saying I'm a poverty scholar, and I know, you know, I know my life, I know the real ins and outs of, and you know, like, I can look at the world and, and create a sentence and formulate it, but there's, it's just like, folks don't want to believe us. Mm. They'll be, they'll just be like, oh, it's all in their head. This happens to black women in the hospital all the time. Mm. And that's why we're dying. Most of, most black women die in postpartum. Mm. And they're like, something is wrong. No, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it feels terrible. It's supposed to. They're like, no, you know, we know that now they're becoming cliches. We know the Selena Williams. We know like what happened to her. And this is someone who knows five languages and, you know, was homeschooled by was homeschooled by two really strong, awesome, like, parents in her life. Like, she had parents in her life, 
she's a top, you know, tennis player in the world, and they still ain't believe her. Mm. So it's like, you know, it's this constant battle for white folks mostly to listen to us. And I think what's dope about being in the Women of Color Collect, to bring it back to roots, is that we're trying to create our own community solution because y'all not going to believe us. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, you know, and it's, and it's not a us versus them. It's more like, who are our allies in this work? Because we do have allies. We do have white folks who are allies. Mm-hmm. I have, you know, white folks have supported me financially. Um, but I just feel like you have to listen and you have to also do the things that we ask you to do. And if that's a sacrifice, if that's a stretch, you got to come out your comfort zone and just trust us. Listen to us, trust us, believe us. Because I really feel like, especially through a class perspective, if we get rid of homelessness, you know, mm-hmm. if that means that the land is somewhat free, right? If we get rid of homelessness and we really stop hoarding wealth and people aren't allowed to buy eight, nine, 25, 3,000 properties, houses, whatever, then we can really come from a solution based perspective. But right now, like Elena alluded to earlier, we're trying to get our basic survival needs met for a lot of our clients. Mm-hmm. As a doula, I have done things like get people's WIC checks, you know? Yep. So it's like, I'm going to sing to the chair on her wig now. And I'm never probably going to, I don't know if I'm going to see her, you know, two, three years from now, but if she ever needs somebody to pick up some milk, I could go get it for her. But it's just like, I think that like, we really need to listen and act on the knowledge that indigenous people all over the world have already, because we've been surviving under the most gruesome, horrific, fear-based shit, right? Mm-hmm. And that's not the totality of who we are. That's not, as a, as a, I don't like saying I'm a single parent. I'm not singular, you know. Mm-hmm. I'm a baby mom. I have a baby. I had a baby. I'm her, I'm her mom. And the people in my community really hold me up, too. You know, I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for black women and brown women. Like, it just wouldn't, I wouldn't be who I am today. And neither mm-hmm. would Zion. And so I just feel like, I just wanted to, like, pull that out with what you said, Elena, because we really, really, really need to support parents in particular. Mm -hmm. But we also really, 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 like, really need to listen to us because we are are the ones that have the solution. We know what we need, and we really need to stop moving away from this Mm top-down approach around who is the expert, Mm -hmm. you know? I always appreciate those mamas or those birth people that I work with who the doctor says yada, yada, yada. And they're like, no, I'm going to do it this way. Mm -hmm. Right. And I'm just like, thank you. I mean, <laughs> this is what I've been trying to like instill in people who can birth babies. It's like you have everything that you need inside of you. You have it all. And yes, there's toxins through people and through the environment outside of us. But you have you are the resource that you need. You mm-hmm. are the natural resource. You and tap into that. And having people support that is only going to make that person much more brighter and fuller in the world. Mm -hmm. And listening to what that person needs is what's actually going to create change. It's not going to be from some scientists. It's not going to be from some Yale study. It's not, those things are not going to happen. Those things have been happening and we have not really seen any systemic change. Mm -hmm. Only thing that poor people have seen is more materialistic shit. Mm -hmm. We have not seen any change around who owns the land, who gets to steward that land mm. and what, and, and do we have a decision around where factories get built, where things get dumped, blah, 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 blah. We don't have agency. We have more shit, but not agency. Mm-hmm. Osoma and Nagasaki, and we will survive Palestine. We survive Vietnam and wounded knee, Rwanda and Mississippi. The 50 stripes around our stars, 50 years to life behind their bars. We survive middle school and self inflicted scars, losing our mothers to our father's hands. We survived slavery and genocide, came back from the dead and spread like wildfire.
yeah, there's more stuff and that stuff is just shit. It's like slave labor, plastic, meaningless stuff. And a lot of it's totally toxic and unhealthy. And no, there hasn't been systemic change. And we're going to have to, or I hope that we can schedule a follow-up call because there's so much more that I would love to spend time discussing with you both. This has already been such an incredibly deep and meaningful interview. And as you were talking about support, I would really love for you both to share with the audience how the roots of labor can be supportive, supported. This collective that you both are so deeply intertwined with and put so much of your life force into, you know, where can people find you? Is there ability for people to donate to your work and help sustain so much? Meaning like you, you both sustain so much. How can the community help sustain you both and the other people in this collective? Yeah, thanks for asking. You know, Roots of Labor Birth Collective, um, our website is www.rootsoflaborbc.com. Um, there is a, a donate page that you can donate directly to the organization. Um, if you follow our Instagram, which is at Roots of Labor BC, we often are posting, like what Juju said, we're posting folks, folks in the collective and or friends of the collective who are raising money, always black or brown or indigenous, who are raising money for their midwifery education or their doula work or to study in another country that is related to like black and brown midwives in another place. So there's always opportunities through our Instagram. You can donate directly to um, to the organization. We also, like, I like to think of Roots of Labor as casting a wide net. We have a pretty wide range of doulas. We have about anywhere from 30 to 50 at any time um, of members in the collective. And we serve the East Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area in California. Um, we are really creative. We, we really agree and, and love systems outside of capitalism. So we do trades, we do barters. Um, we've had folks who just like made a zine and sent the proceeds to, to roots of labor. Mm. We've had folks who, um, want to do a doula training in their neighborhood. So they've paid for us to come down there and like do a doula training, um, and all kinds of innovative way. We've, we've had people who said, I want to offer a scholarship to your doula training because our doula trainings are really unique. They're four days. We do them once a year. Um, and it's, all people of color, and we bring in all kinds of other healers to come and do really a four-day intensive reproductive justice orientation that brings you into the collective. We've had folks be like, I want to sponsor a person to be mm. to be here. And so we're able to offer scholarships because of that. So, um, Or we've had several podcast requests of like, let's spread your word. So if you have a podcast, if you have any sort of platform or anything like that, shout us out, um, give us money. If you don't have money to give, send us prayers and love, mm. um, you know, tell your ancestors to to stand with our ancestors in, in the work that we're doing. Yeah. And also just also sharing the work with others. Sharing is such a powerful way to combat capitalism in um. so many ways. Like I literally have a car because of GoFundMe. Someone <laughs> stole my car. I was not going to call the police because I'm not trying to get folks into that whole thing. And I was like, is literally a car worth like $500? Yeah. And they stole it. And I was just like, fuck, how am I going to get to this birth that I'm on call for? It? And in a week, I raised $3,000 and bought another car. So I think that sharing is a powerful way in sharing our work. You know, um, Also, I believe in monthly contributions. Maybe you can only give $5,000 a month. That shit adds up in three years. You give in something you know, I don't want to say shit, that's, that adds up, you know, and that can be powerful too. I think that um, sustainability is always about flow and, you know, prayer increases that flow, sharing the work, donating to the work and just, you know, and that's, you know, it's all a part of the flow. I think that's what helps mm -hmm. um, with anything. So we always, you know, we always, I always appreciate when folks lift me up and lift the work up that I do. And, and that's how, you know, for me, that's how I've been sustainable. And people who, you know, just to be real, like I live in, I live in a home that I share in this two, this four bedrooms, and me and my daughter occupy half the bedrooms. I don't pay for her bedroom. My community actually subsidizes my daughter's rent, my rent, so that my daughter can have her own bedroom. Uh -huh. And so that's a that's like a yearly thing, right? So we'll revisit this in a year, but it's a way. I really believe in monthly contributions. So mm -hmm. it's a it's a it could be a powerful way to to help us to say, okay, we know this is, this mm -hmm. is coming in every month. So yeah, just something to introduce, you know, another way to give as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Convince your local grocery store to accept WIC or accept food stamps. Yeah. 
you know, there's all kinds of things that helps not just our clients that helps everyone, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Oh my goodness. Thank you both so much. This has been probably one of my favorite conversations on the podcast. And like I said, I would really love to at some point have another conversation. I, I want to respect both of your times or both of your time. I know it's so valuable and you're both on call for births. And, um, so thank you again. And, uh, I really look forward to for the wild supporting you and this broader community that's tuning in to do something tangible and take action with these issues. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. It's been really a pleasure because we we are so, you know, as Juju said, we we can go down a rabbit hole of midwifery care or of doula care mm-hmm. or talking about placentas or, you know, there's so many different avenues and it's really refreshing to also speak about environmentalism and the way that mm-hmm. RJ and EJ intersect. So thank you for inviting us and having us here for that. I'd like to thank the For the Wild podcast team, co-producer and editor Andrew Storrs, co-producer and writer Francesca Glassbell, music coordinator Carter Lou McElroy, our communications director Aaron Wise, and our co-managing directors Mara Joy and Melanie Younger. The musical guests you heard today, Jason Marsalis, Irvin Mayfield, and Climbing Poetry. If you haven't already, please rate us on iTunes, as it really helps build our community. Also, sign up for our newsletter at forthewild.world. 